God is so good. We're so glad that you're joining us for our online service this morning here at Core Church. My name is Blaine Bartell, and uh, it's an honor to uh, fill the uh, fill the pulpit for Pastor Brad this weekend. Love this church. Uh, uh, we are definitely uh, really, really good friends and uh, support each other in uh, our different uh, outreaches and ministries. So it's good to see you this morning. You know, uh, Core Church has been uh, walking through a series on enduring and persevering. And what better time uh, to endure and persevere than uh, this moment in history in our, our country? And so the title uh, of uh, just a short message I want to share with you this morning is Hope Endures. And we've been uh, taking our text from 1 Corinthians 13, 13, which says, and now abides faith, hope, and love. These three, the greatest of these is love. And so we see these three virtues and these uh, three characteristics of a living, breathing uh, Christian and uh, a li living, breathing spirit moving in us as his believers and his image makers, faith, hope, and love. And so today I want to talk to you about hope. Uh, the, the scripture says in Psalm 34 that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit, that God is always a God of hope that uh, whatever we're going through, whatever crushing we may feel in a moment, uh, wherever our heart has been broken, that the Lord is close, that he's not distant, uh, he's not indifferent, but he's close, and he wants to show up right there. And I think one of my uh, favorite uh, stories in Scripture when it comes to hope is uh, the story of a a man named Gideon, actually a very young man. And uh, he's actually recorded in the uh, Hebrews Hall of Faith. Uh, when uh, the writer of Hebrews talks about all the, the great men and women of faith, Gideon actually makes the list. And, and I think we'll see why this morning. I want to just read you a couple verses uh, from the beginning of his introduction and his story in Scripture. And uh, it's found in Judges chapter 6 and verse number 11. And it says that the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizarite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it or to hide from the Midianites, is actually what the literal translation says. And it says, the angel of the Lord appeared unto Gideon. So here is Gideon, he's threshing wheat in a winepress, and he's hiding, and now the angel shows up appears to him and says, the Lord is with thee, mighty warrior, or another translation says, mighty man of valor. But listen to Gideon's response. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord be with us. You ever said that? Someone says God's with us, Jesus is good, and you say, well, if he's really good, well, if he's really with me, then why has all this happened to us? What, what, what's going on? How come all this negative and all this evil or all this sickness or all this mess or my job's gone, why has this happened if God's really with me? It's probably the greatest question that we have as followers of Jesus or just as human beings in this world. Like if God's really present, if God is really near and close, why is this happening to me? And that was Gideon's response to the angel. He went on to say, where are all the wonders that our fathers told us of? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us. So not only, you know, I don't think God is with me, but I think he's abandoned us. I don't think he's anywhere close. He's obviously left us. You ever felt that way? Wherever you're sitting this morning, your kitchen, your bed, your couch, you ever felt like God's left you? I have. I think we've all been there in our periods of loss. 
our periods of brokenness, our secret sin, our addictions, the things that we can't seem to get past and conquer. We feel sometimes like God is not just unclose, but he's literally walking away. And so it says in verse 14, in the midst of Gideon's lament, where is God? The Lord turned to him. And now we see something different. It's like, okay, we had an angel speaking, but now it's the Lord. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in this strength that you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? But the Lord, but Lord, Gideon replied, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my family. And the Lord answered, I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites down as one man. So even when God gets in the middle of this, and the Lord speaks directly to Gideon in this wine press, even in that moment, he questions God. And so I just want you to know that it's okay if you've ever questioned God. God's not mad at you. He's still showing up. If you've ever doubted, if you've ever wondered if God is real, if you've ever looked up to heaven and cried out in anger or in disbelief, what's going on in my life? God still loves you, and he's still present, and he's still there to help, and he hasn't given up on you. First thing I want you to to know this morning is that the hope of God always comes to the hopeless. God's hope will come to us when we're hopeless. And I love how God shows up in Gideon's life in a wine press, threshing wheat. And we don't know exactly why. I can tell you that the that all of Israel was hiding in dens and caves in the mountains. Uh, The Midianites had totally destroyed this nation. And of all the people that come down from the mountains, down comes Gideon, gets in a wine press. He's threshing wheat in a wine press, which is extremely unusual. You don't thresh wheat in a wine press. A wine press is a place to tread on grapes to make juice, which when it ferments, becomes wine. But he's threshing wheat. And God shows up. And it says also that he's hiding from the Midianites. Doesn't want to get caught. Maybe he's wanting to make bread. Maybe he wants some food. But he's threshing wheat in a wine press. And we see the beauty of Jesus in this moment. You see, every story in the Old Testament, every part of the Old Testament is there for one thing, to point us to the Messiah, to point us to Christ, to see Jesus in these moments. And we see the beginning of our deliverance the beginning of our hope for a hopeless situation in the wine press. Because in this wine press, we see both the body and the blood of Jesus. We see the bread in the threshing of the weed, and we see the blood in the fact that it was a place where grapes were tread on. And so this is the beginning of our deliverance. This is the beginning of our hope, is knowing that Jesus died for us, rose from the dead, and gave us the power of his resurrection to live on, that our hope is in the death and resurrection of Jesus, that that's where deliverance begins, that that's where freedom starts. And so God speaks to Gideon and says, get out of this wine press, move from this into bringing deliverance, not just to yourself, but to your entire nation. And I love this. Friends, can I tell you something? There's hope for you right now. God believes in you. He loves you. He is for you. And it doesn't matter how awful your life has been to this moment. It doesn't matter how many doubts you have. It doesn't matter how many times you've walked away from God. God is with you. And I love that when Gideon even argues with an angel, can you imagine an angel coming to the foot of your bed, standing there with a wingspan of like 12 feet? He's 12 foot high, and he speaks in this thundering voice, God is with you, O mighty man or mighty woman of valor. Can you imagine looking at that angel and saying, no? 
Can you imagine not believing at that moment that God was with you? Well, that's how hopeless Gideon was. And yet in the middle of his hopelessness, in, the, in his worst doubts that God was real, God didn't quit. He came right back and said, come on, Gideon. Get out of this wine press. Take the first step and let me deliver you. And let me show you my power. Friends, sometimes it's that first step. Just believing in God enough. Believing that there's a plan enough to just get out of bed. I remember five, six years ago, I was in such a a bad place in my life. I'd lost everything. And, you know, through my own sin and through my own decisions and And I'm living in this place of hopelessness. And I remember just all I wanted to do was crawl into my bed and go to sleep. And I felt like if I could just get to sleep, I could escape my world. I I wouldn't have to face the world that was looking at me and the decisions and the brokenness that I was encountering. And I remember God just saying, get out of bed, Blaine. Get out of bed. Get dressed. Walk out the door. Take a first step into your new life. Take a first step into resurrection. We have to start somewhere. We have to get out of that wine press. We have to quit hiding and show up in life for God to move. God always asks us to do something before he does something. And if we'll do something in the natural, he'll do something in the supernatural. God told Moses, stretch out your rod and I'll part the Red Sea. So if you do this, Moses, I'll do this. That's the power of God. God asks us, will you do the simple thing? Will you take the first step, and I'll do the big step? I'll bring the deliverance. So the hope of God always comes to the hopeless. The second thing I want you to see this morning is the hope of God calls for faith over fear that he calls us into faith, that hope is a first step to actually believing that the promises of God are true. I love what uh, we read in Romans chapter 4, verse number 18. It says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed. Isn't that great? That against every hope in the world, Abraham in hope Believe so that he would become the father of many nations. Just as it was what said to him, so shall your offspring be. You see, God gave Abraham this promise that you're going to have offspring. You're going to be a father of many nations. But yet he's 90-something years old. His wife Sarah's 90-something years old. There's no hope for them to conceive and have a baby. And yet it says against all hope, Abraham believed in hope because he had a promise from God. You see, we've got to dare to have faith in God in our most hopeless moments. And I love how this story of Gideon progresses. He goes out, gets out of his wine press, gathers an army together. He calls people and men to arms and says, we're going to go fight these Midianites. And at the end of the day, He has 32,000 men that are ready to fight with him, which is quite significant, unless you understand that there's about a half a million Midianites. So he's got 32,000. Midianites have a half a million, but he's ready to go to war. He's moved from hope to faith. He's moved from just getting out of the wine press and taking a step to actually putting an army together and saying, we're going to do this because God is with me. God promised he would deliver us out of the hand of the Midianites. You see, hope is not this, I hope my team wins the Super Bowl kind of hope. Hope is not this, well, I kind of hope I get a raise. Biblical hope is not a kind of hope so narrative where maybe something good will happen, just being an optimist or just being sunny and cheery. Real Christian hope is knowing that Christ is with us, knowing that he's given us these promises. And so Gideon, as he's ready to go by faith with these 32,000 to see God's deliverance in his life, in his nation, 
the Lord speaks to him and says, Gideon, don't go yet. He said, I want you to tell everybody that is afraid in your 32,000 to go home. Can you imagine this? They're about to fight a half a million people. They're about to go to war against all odds. And God says, tell anyone that's afraid to go home. And I'm sure Gideon's thinking, well, we're about to fight a half a million folks. I mean, I think probably everyone's afraid, Lord. And you know how he found out who was afraid? The Lord said, you go tell them if they're afraid to go home. You see, we find out if we have fear when we either stay or go. Whether we stick it out and keep going and keep persevering and keep enduring or we give up and walk away. That's where you find out if you have faith. It's not a matter of whether you feel fear because you can feel fear in the middle of your faith. It's a matter of what, do you, what decision do you make in crisis time? What decision do you make in the moment? So Gideon gathers 32,000, says, guys, we're going to go to war, but the Lord said one thing. If there's some of you that are afraid, I need you to step out and go home. If you're afraid to fight this battle and to go to war with me, I'm going to release you to go home. You know what the scripture says? 22,000 people walked away. 22,000 of warriors that said, I'm with you, said, I'm no longer with you, and I'm going home. They made a decision based on their fear. You see, they could have felt that fear and stayed there, and that would have been faith. You can feel fear and still live in faith. You can feel anxiety. You can feel emotions. But the emotions are not how we live. We live by faith in Christ, and we endure, and we persevere through our fears, through our anxieties, through our disappointments. But Gideon's left with 10,000, but these 10,000 are men of faith. They believed against all hope. The next thing is this. The hope of God always lives ready for battle. The hope of God is always ready for a battle because life brings battles. This is a, this is a world I think we can all agree that isn't easy. It's a beautiful world. We see God present in our world. We see the beauty of his creation, the beauty of the image makers, our friends and our neighbors and the people that we know and love that we get to do our lives with, but yet it is a battle. Paul speaks to the Ephesus Christians and said, soldier up, guys, ladies. Come on. You know, get your Get your stuff on. You know, get the shield of faith. Pick it up. Get that sword of the Spirit. Make sure you got your helmet on. Soldier up. It is a battle, but you can win if you dress accordingly, if you live accordingly. So the hope of God always lives ready for battle. It's not this hope that just sits back and doesn't do anything. It's ready for battle. It's not careless or come what may. It is hope that endures. And so we see this as Gideon is ready to go to battle with his 10,000 that are left. But God comes one more time. And he says, Gideon, just one more thing. Before you go to war, he said, I want you to take your 10,000, and I want you to get a drink by the brook. But he said, I want you to watch how they drink. And if they get on their hands and knees like a dog, lapping up the water, licking it up with their mouth, he said, I want you to send them home. But if they get to the brook and they begin to bring up that water with their hand, cupping the water to their mouth, those are the ones that you can keep in your army. And so God didn't even explain himself. He doesn't even say, well, this is why. He just says, do this. And Gideon, in this great faith that he had in God, said, all right. And he got his 10,000, and the Scripture says that he called them to the brook. He said, let's all drink, and then we go to war. And so everyone begins to drink. They all get down. They begin to have their drink of water. And Gideon watches how they drink, and then he finally says, all right. 
everyone that was drinking on your hands and knees like a dog. He said, I want you to stand up. So they all stand up. All the ones that were drinking like a dog stood up. And out of 10,000 warriors, 9,700 stood up and said, that's us. We drank like dogs. Now, can you believe that? 9,700. And now Gideon had to look into the eyes of these warriors and say, listen, hate to break it to you, but you have to go home. Why do we have to go home? Because you drank the wrong way. What do you mean we drank the wrong way? Well, you, you drank like dogs. And God said, if you drink like a dog, you got to go home. So they're like, really? Yes. So 9,700 trek home. He's left with 300 to fight a half a million people. Can you imagine that? 9,700, go home. They walk in the house. Their mom or dad are probably like, oh, what are you doing home? I thought you were going to go fight with Gideon. Yeah, I was. Well, were you afraid? No, I wasn't afraid. Well, what happened? I drank the wrong way. Well, how did you drink? I drank like a dog. I've told you not to drink like a dog. You know, I mean, this is unbelievable. But there was a purpose in this because, listen, when you put your face in the water, when you're going to battle, when you dunk your face into the brook, you are unaware of your circumstances. You are not ready for a surprise attack. You see, the men that were cupping the water, bringing it up to their mouth, had their vision, had their sights set, were alert and ready, even in enjoying a moment of pleasure before battle. And God is looking for ready warriors. Don't get lost in the water of the world. Don't get lost in the pleasures of life. God gives us pleasures for our enjoyment that are healthy and good, but we can't get lost in the things of this world lest we get overtaken in battle. The last thing, and I'll leave you with this this morning, the hope of God doesn't always make sense. What does that mean? You know, when God saw that Gideon was down to 300, going to fight a million or half a million people. He gave him a battle strategy that made no sense whatsoever. He told him, he said, I want you to go surround the Midianites in the valley on the three mountains that surround them. Well, how did we do that? We got 300 spread out. So they spread out on three different fronts, 100 each. God says, wait till it's dark. And he said, when it's dark, I want you to blow a trumpet as loud as you can. Uh, But Lord, um, you know, when you blow trumpets, you're kind of announcing you're coming. And we we think a surprise attack might be be in order, since we only got 300. I don't don't know why we want to announce that we're coming when we only have 300. But that's what the Lord said. Blow your trumpet. A trumpet was a sign of war, and a trumpet meant we're coming to destroy you, and a trumpet said we're not afraid of you. The only time an enemy army would attack with a trumpet is because they knew they were going to win. They were just like prophesying and announcing, you're done, and just get ready. And then he said, I want you to shout the sword of the Lord and Gideon, all 300, as loud as you can after the trumpet. So they shout as well. And then he says, I want you to light a torch. Uh, and have that torch covered in, uh, covered with a, a, a water bottle, or not a water bottle, but a, uh, a water jug. And he said, and then I want you to break the water jug, the clay, the clay jug. And so, like, this doesn't make sense. Like, this is going to win? And so they do it. And you can imagine what happened to the Midianites. They're down in the valley. They're uh, partying. It's, you know, 9 or 10 at night. And all of a sudden, they hear a shout. They, they hear a trumpet. They're looking around. What's going on? Something's happening. Maybe there's a war about to happen. Maybe someone's about to attack us. And then they see, in the dark of night, 300 fires appear out of nowhere. Because 
when these jugs break over the fires, the torches, it just almost looks supernatural, like 300 flames appearing out of nowhere. And it was so confusing to the Midianites as to what was going on that they began to fight each other. They began to destroy each other. And by the time that Gideon and his army marched down to that valley, they had destroyed one another, and what was left ran into the dark of night. And 300 warriors who were full of faith, full of hope, living ready, willing to take the first step, won one of the greatest battles that we ever could read about in history, simply because they followed God's plan, and they followed God even when things didn't make sense. And I wonder right now, we take about two minutes to close our time together. I wonder if you have some things right now that don't make sense. I wonder if you're walking right now with God and you're looking around saying, none of this really makes sense. Uh, why is this going on in my life? Why is, why is this happening? And it kind of reminds me of a couple disciples after the crucifixion of Jesus that were walking on the road to Emmaus. It's a seven-mile walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and uh, they're disillusioned. They're like, you know, forlorn, in despair, and as they're walking, they're complaining. They're saying, what happened to this Jesus? What happened to this revolution, to this, uh, this love that God was bringing to our world through this amazing man, and now he's gone? And it says that as the two are walking, another man walks with them, and they didn't know who he was didn't recognize him, just kind of wondered why this guy was walking with him. And this guy uh, looks at the two and says, you know, why are you, so, why are you so forlorn? Why are you so depressed? What are you doing? And, and they look and say, are you, are you the only one that hasn't heard what happened? Do you not realize Jesus is dead? He was crucified? It's over. And... They said something in that moment that I think we've all said. They said, but we had hoped. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We had hoped for a deliverer. We had hoped this was going to work out. We had hoped he was going to stop Rome from their oppression. We had hoped this was our Messiah. And they didn't even realize it, friends, but Jesus, their hope was right there with them. They were talking to Jesus and that he was resurrected and risen from the dead. And he was about to bring his kingdom to earth through his resurrection. We've all had our own road to Emmaus, winding down a rocky and a lonely journey. Maybe we had hoped that our marriage would be better by now. Maybe we had hoped that our son would have come home by now. Maybe we had hoped that this depression we've been encountering had lifted by now. Maybe we had hoped that our career would be on a better trajectory by now. Maybe we had hoped that that tumor wasn't actually cancerous or that our baby would come to full term. We had hoped. Can I just tell you, when life feels dark and hopeless, that's when Jesus is right there walking with you. And he'll walk through this with you. Our roads don't always make sense and they often feel unfair, but whether you recognize it or not, Jesus is walking with you. Because sometimes our greatest hope is just knowing that and that we endure and that we get through and we get to the other side. I want to pray with you right now because there's some of you right now that just feel a real lack of hope and emotions are stirring and you just 
don't know how you're going to make it, where that next step is going to be. And neither do I, but God does. And right there, in that bed, at that table, on that couch, in that chair, Jesus is present. He is with you. Father, I pray for my my dear friends that are watching right now, for brothers and sisters in Christ, for those that may be uh, away from Christ or maybe even feel like they've been abandoned by God as Gideon did. And Lord, I ask you in this moment right now to be present with them, to show yourself strong, to be with them in that wine press and to help them to recognize that the body and blood, that the life of Christ was poured out for them to be delivered, to be delivered from sin and from fear and from hopelessness and to realize that resurrection is around the corner for us if we'll just reach out to you. And that, Lord, our life is more than this life, but it's an eternal life. And this isn't the full story. This earth doesn't contain all that we know of God and all of the work of God in our life, that there is another life, an eternal life. Let us be mindful of the great hope, the great hope of our eternity, the great hope of the return of Jesus to make all things right in this earth. If you need Jesus in your life, just pray this prayer. Jesus, come into my life. Set me free. Deliver me from fear. And bring me hope. In your name I pray.